Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Said, and the eyes of them both were opened. Talking about Adam and Eve here. And they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Can you imagine what it must have been like? I've heard people talk about what they ate and the food and the plants and no poison ivy and no poison oak and no snakes that bite and, and I've heard them talk about no thorns, no briars. I've heard them talk about all that stuff. But what it must have been like to just walk with God in the cool of the day. Just to spend every waking hour, if it was your desire, in the presence of God. And as soon as they transgressed, What it said, it said, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. You get in God's presence. Preacher don't even have to point out your problems. When you're in God's presence, you'll feel it. You know it. I believe that. I believe that. You said you don't ever have to preach against sin? No, 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 because we spend so much time running from his presence, that's part of my job. But it said as soon as, as soon as they knew, their eyes were open, they knew they were naked. And they hid themselves, verse 8, from the presence of the Lord God. times that I've hid myself. Try to hide yourself. You really don't accomplish it. Because God's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He knows all. He's everywhere. He's not confined by space or time. He knows where you're at. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. But there's times you want to hide But they hid themselves from the presence of God. After Cain killed Abel, God spoke the curse upon Cain. The Bible records that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, I know, we know they got cast out of the garden, but evidently there was still a presence of God to be found because the Bible said Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. When you're harboring sin, and sin's in your heart. And I, I'd already studied, been studying on this and putting this together last night and today. And, and after I was done, I went to the room to start preparing physically Prepare, shave and wash my face, scrub my ears, shave all the extra hair off my ears and stuff. <laughs> Listen to another preacher, preacher preach, and he said something about this same garden experience. And he said, he said, the problem is, he said, a lot of us we tie, we tie this outward attire to salvation, and it's not. He said, don't jump too high. Some of you liberals might have, he, I, I laugh, he said, some of you liberals might be thinking, oh, he's got the revelation pretty soon, we'll be getting naked in here. He said, no, 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 no. He said, that's, that's not it. He said, you missed, you missed it. He said, he said, but Adam and Eve's relationship.
relationship with God, the problem was disobedience and a heart problem. But before it was over, he said, I'm not too happy with the way you're clothed either. <laughs> he's seen their heart, but he's not blind to what we're wearing on the outside. Amen. I'm, you said, Brother, are you getting into all that? I, no, not, I'm not planning on it. That wasn't part at all what I'm going to talk about. But, but I don't believe God's blind. I mean, if, if, if I, if I want to start dressing like a rock star every place I went, or, or a, a, I don't know if pedophiles have a way to dress, homosexuals have a way to dress, prostitutes have a way to dress, they've pretty much got a uniform. They convey what's in their heart or what, what's on their mind by how they appear. And you say, well, you think we ought to wear uniforms? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with having a dress code for yourself. And remind yourself who you appear, who, who you represent. Stations, service station attendants used to wear a uniform. Grocery people wore uniforms. Mailmen wore a uniform. Army people wore uniforms. People who worked for the airlines wore uniforms. Had a dress code if you worked in an office. And, and, and nobody really rocked the boat on that. They just did it. Somebody said, well, people will be willing to do something for gold. They won't do it for God. Well, amen or on me. I'm not telling you how to dress. Just like I said earlier, but God can speak to your heart and tell you if he's not pleased with something. Well, hallelujah. We shout now. Let's get back to the subject. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Exodus chapter 33 verse 14 and he said my presence shall go with thee now, he's talking to Moses here Moses is telling him how, how am I going to do this how, how's this going to happen and God spoke to Moses and said my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest and he said unto him if thy presence go not with me carry us not up hence Moses said if you're not going I don't want to go. Amen. It's, it's important. Church, church going is important. Being, being gathered together with, with, with people of like belief and children of God. And, and one thing I've, I've, I've conveyed over the years, there's a five-fold ministry God's placed in place. It doesn't say five-fold. Just list them off. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Is that right? Yeah. Five-fold ministry. And it's for the perfecting of the saints. How much contact do we have with what that, those, those five members of ministry if we stay secluded in our homes? And, and the one that we can come in contact with is hit and miss. A lot of times it's more miss than hit because when you're dealing with televangelists, there's more frauds than there is real. Amen. Well, amen, Brother Ray. That's good preaching. Yeah, I appreciate it too. I like it. <laughs> but he said, my presence shall go with thee. I want to be in his presence. I want to want to be in his presence. You hear me? God Cause me to be in a position with you relationally that I want to be in your presence. Yeah, well, that's just that just goes without saying. You're a Christian. You want to be in God's presence. No, that doesn't go without saying. I'm married. Been married for 30 years. That woman right there. And I love her. And there's times I don't want to be in her presence. If her attitude's a little 
sideways, I give her room. Some days I know it's me. You roll out of bed, you know you, your attitude is just not right. I mean, you roll out of bed, whether you had a bad dream or stubbed your toe or all the plans just fell through and the weather messed everything up. And, and there have been many times I've looked at her and apologized. I'm sorry, I'm just angry with everything. I'm not you, I'm just angry. So, so just because we're married doesn't mean that I always want to be in her presence. I can tell you this, though. I've, I've found out I don't want to be far from her presence. As a Christian, I want to want to be in his presence. I don't want to want a gulf between me and he. I don't want to take a break. There's been times I've looked at my wife and I thought, I just need to take a break from ministry. As I evangelized and, and preached and preached and preached and preached and preached. And when I was younger, I'd think, well, let's just take a break from, from ministry and, and even get away from God's people and just try to, and then I go in, in the world and, and just go sightseeing or something. A lot of times I think, well, I'll just relax and decompress and things that I see vex my soul to the point to where I didn't enjoy it. And when I figured out that I could take a little break from ministry but not take a break from his presence, I began to enjoy my, my little breaks a lot more. Amen. But Moses said, I don't want to go if you're not going. Psalmist David, he, he wrote this, and, I, and I, I think it was prophetic of him to write this. But, but in, in 51, Psalms 51, verse 9 through, through 12 said, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Let me still pray that prayer. I was praying it again this morning. God, forgive me, help me, cleanse me, make me right before thee. Amen. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. And I, I pray that and pray that and pray that. And, and, and at least once a year, I'll push the plate back and, 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 and try my best to just kill the flesh down to a point to where I know, I know that every day I'm reminding myself of what I want more out of this life. My desires, my pleasures, my will, or Him. Amen. And, 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 and renewing me a right spirit. Verse 11 said, cast me not away from thy presence. I want to be in your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. I don't even know really what they understood about salvation and spirit in the Old Testament, but David must have had a glimpse because he wrote about it like he was writing in the New Testament. Amen. Make my spirit right. Keep me in your spirit. Keep me in your presence. Give me the joy that I know is in your presence. Amen. Here was a man, here was a man that from what I understand, because of history, wasn't able to go into the house of God up till he was up, up to his generation. And, and was he, wasn't he the one that wrote, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Because, because he was then invited and the generational problem had passed and he could walk in. Amen. So, so what a miraculous thing for him. Amen. What a joyous thing for for him under the law. You and I don't have that anymore because we've been given access. Amen. You and I, every one of us, and it doesn't matter our past. It doesn't matter our past doctrine, our past sins, our past life. If we desire to approach the throne of grace and mercy, we have access. Amen. I was glad when they said it to me. And friend, how many times are we glad when somebody says, hey, let's go to church. Or is it all me or all mine? 
it's church time again. You're a preacher, Brother Ray. You ever felt that way? I've absolutely felt that way. And I'll tell you, I, the two things that bring on me feeling that way, one is if my spirit's not right, and two is if their spirit's not right. Amen. But I appreciate his presence, don't you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. There's, there's a bunch of them downstairs, officer. I don't know if, what, who you're looking for is down there or not. Uh, this stairwell either side. Amen. So restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold with me thy free spirit. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah began to prophesy. He said, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest or with you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, David had already mentioned this in Psalm. Cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And here Isaiah said, stammering lips in another tongue when he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest we're with you may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. They're refreshing. And, and, and it's been a, a topic of conversation in Bible study about how much we can or should or shouldn't rely on. But I looked up the word refreshing and, and, and looked up synonyms for refreshing. And refreshing is the same as rejuvenation. And refreshed. How many knows what being refreshed is? I've, people, people sometimes. Well, they, they go to the shower and they refresh. Take a dip in a cold, cold body of water. That'll refresh you. But you know, I, I, like, I like refreshments. <laughs> so I got this size. <laughs> refresh also means to eat. Amen. So the times when refreshing comes, it's a time when your spirit eats. It's a time when your your mind, your spirit, you, you, you begin to sit at that body, you know, and, and, and we, we talk about communion and taking this is my bread was broken for you. And we also know that this word is the bread of life. Amen. And we eat and we eat that living bread, that living word, and it is refreshing to our souls. Hallelujah. He said that he said that we're stammering lips another tongue when he speak to this people. And I noticed a lot of folks have kicked the first part of that to the side. Amen. Because of what happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, they all they, they, they was all gathered in that upper room and the cloven tongues of fire. And I'm not against it at all. I mean, we named the church the upper room. I believe in, a, in, a, in an experience with the Spirit of God. And the cloven tongues of fire come set on each one of them. And they begin to speak in tongues as they was instructed. No, no, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. And, and I was talking with a brother the other day, and this is no reflection on him. I've been preaching about this for years in places where it was unpopular. Friend, if somebody's going to teach you how to speak in tongues, you tie my tie, I tie your tie, or see the key to my Honda, you're not going to get tongues. You're going to get tongue tied. Amen? <laughs> and it is going to be gibberish, but the Spirit itself speaking. And the Spirit itself caused them to speak in other tongues. And I know sometimes it's men of, of tongues of men and in angels. Amen. More than once I've run across people said, well, so-and-so stood up and began preaching or began ministering in a tongue, in a language they did not understand. I've heard of two or three cases this happened in Mexico. And, and one time a, a, an unbeliever stood up and, and uh, it, it was a... Uh, an Indian from a tribe down in Mexico and they didn't speak English at all and fit, couldn't hardly speak Spanish and they stood up uh, as they understood the translator and gave their heart to the Lord uh, and lifted their hands uh, and when they began to shout and praise the Lord uh, what they began to say they didn't understand it was it was just another tongue to them uh, but what they were saying was hey man they said praise the Lord sorry we got a little bit distracted we got police officers and folks crossing through here, but <clears throat> she began to say, uh, 
Do you remember how what the phrase I want to get it right? Jesus is the Son of God. Is that what she was saying? Jesus is the Son of God. So. Some, something to that nature, just over and over and over and over again. Couldn't speak a word of English. She was saying it in English as she stood there amongst the crowd. Or the Bible is the Word of God. 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 Didn't know a word about what she was saying. Amen. Didn't know. And I've heard of others stand up to testify or preach, and they said they felt this overwhelming presence. Where are you headed? Okay. There's been a lot of law officer traffic back here. Two. see how things were before she headed back in there. Jesus help us. But, but stand up and begin speaking and preach a whole message in a language you don't understand and have such an effect that the body of people they were preaching to responded to it. On that day of Pentecost, they said they each heard them speaking in their own language. I know there's a prayer language, and, and, and I know that there's, what well, Paul said, though I speak in tongues of men and angels, I understand all that. And, and, and I feel about it like this. Paul said, I would that you all. But I also understand it's a gift, and so many times they want to throw away this. The first part of the prophecy that Isaiah gave was stammering lips. They don't want to accept that. The judges out here that want to judge about whether they got it or whether they don't got it. But the Bible said with stammering lips. And, and I've seen people stammer lips and stammer lips and stammer lips for a long time and never speak in tongues. And I am not the judge about whether or not they got that. You know what? The Bible didn't tell me to look and see whether they spoke in tongues to tell me whether or not they was a brother or sister in Christ. He said, you know them by this. They have love one for another. He said, you know them by this. Amen. That, that they have love one for another. There's another thing that he told them too. He said, he said uh, and it slipped my mind right now. But another thing that I've been in churches where they, they want to get right up in your face, right up in your ear and get right down close to you and and they don't even think you're saved until you speak in tongues. It tells me they're unbelievers. What? My Bible says that tongues are given as a sign to the unbeliever. Amen. And I'll tell you what. If my spirit bears witness one with another, that's the other scripture. My spirit bears witness one with another, and they have love one for another. The Bible says that we can tell a tree by its fruit. And to me, that carries way more weight than hearing somebody speak in tongues, because I'll tell you this, friend, I've heard tongues faked. I've seen false tongues. I have. And I've seen a whole lot of people pressed into something that wasn't genuine so they could pump the numbers. And I don't care if this gets on YouTube. I hope it does. So they could pump the numbers to make themselves look good and the person never survives. They don't exist. Two or three weeks later, a month later, six months later, they're gone. Because it wasn't a real experience. The Spirit gives the utterance. Amen. And if the Spirit don't give the utterance, leave it alone. That's, that's where Brother Ray stands. Amen. That's how I feel. That's how I understand it. And if that's the way, that, that's the only way I can preach it. I believe it. I believe it's real. But I believe there's a whole lot pressed into something that's not real. And if it was real to the degree of manifesting that they say that it is, there should be a whole lot more miracles taking place in their honor. 
Amen. But I don't want a facade and I don't want to fake and I don't want to push somebody into something or push them out of the church because they wouldn't comply. My Bible reads this way. He said, what is it, Acts 2.38? He said, repent, believe, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Didn't say you might be filled with the Holy Ghost. Said you would. You shall. And if this is all the inspired word of God, and I believe it is, you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't know when the timeline is on that. The time I, I repented and the time I know I was filled with the Holy Ghost was, was about a year span. I've known people that, that it was two or three years. I know some that's still seeking the Holy Ghost. Some may not experience all of that until they break the clouds of glory, meeting Him in the air. I don't know, but I know the Word of God is true. He said, you shall be filled. Amen. And, and just because you haven't checked the boxes that I have in my book doesn't mean you're not checking the boxes he has in his. Amen. Because, because he didn't make it real narrow. Just one little, one little thing over here gets to qualify you. Amen. When it said, by his prophet, he said, with stammering lips and another tongue. And I'll tell you another thing that happens. Uh, uh, this this, this uh, travail. Uh, if somebody goes into travail before God, how can you look at me in the eye and tell me that that's not the Holy Ghost driving them into that? When somebody gets down and bawls and cries and bawls and snots and slobs, and there's no intelligible words but it's that groaning as the deep calleth under the deep and tell me that's not the Holy Ghost amen I have a problem with that you say well brother I got a problem with you well then take it up with my boss because until he tells me different and shows me in the word I, I can't preach it any different I am not the gatekeeper I'm a friend of the bridegroom but I'm trying to get as many into the bridal hall as I can amen I'm not trying to push people away or disqualify. I want as many in, amen, to that wedding supper of the Lamb as I can possibly usher in. Amen. Amen. And just because my little clique has some little understanding of qualification based upon a verse or possibly two that tries to eliminate everybody else to make myself look better, God help me. Amen. It's not about me, my ego, my name, or my understanding. It's all about Shall come 
from the presence of the Lord. What's he talking about? Refreshing. Now, now Acts two, Acts chapter two is already taking place. The time, the, the day of Pentecost is already taking place. So what's he talking about? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He's talking about when the presence of the Lord sweeps into this place. How does that happen? Well, he, he dwells in the presence of the praise of his people. And he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there shall I be in the midst. And he inhabits the praise of his people. So when we get together and we begin to worship him and praise him, I, amen, that's what I was singing about before I started preaching. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I love to feel his presence. I don't care if the sound system's any good. I don't care if the, if the climate control's any good. I I don't care if the musicianship's any good. What I do care is if his presence is there. Amen. I've been in shacks. You can see through the walls. They were hanging babies up in hankies alongside the walls as they went to sleep. And we was all swatting mosquitoes. Two little 30 or 40 watt bulbs run by a little generator out back. Amen. And I'll tell you something. We felt the presence of God move in that place. And it didn't matter. And nobody wanted to go. But we was running out of fuel in the generator. Amen. The little mayor of the, of, the, of the Indian community, the chief, I guess is what he'd be, he repented that night, rededicated his life to God. Amen. Tell me, I don't care. Amen. I love, I love all this stuff. I mean, I enjoy it. I don't love it, but I enjoy it. I enjoy the padded pews and the air conditioning and the nice, the nice, beautiful building that we've, we've been allowed to assemble in here, and I'm thankful for it. But friend, my, my, my the, the, the thrust of, of my effort is to enter into his presence. Always, always, always. When I preach a camp meeting, when I preach a revival, when I preach here on Sundays, when I preach wherever I preach, on the sidewalk, or on a stage at a park someplace, it's to enter into his presence. Amen. To set a stage for his presence to come. Because when his presence is there, it begins to minister and move. Hallelujah. So how does that tongue thing work? I don't, I don't know how exactly it works. I got to worshiping God one night. Singing. Playing guitar so I only had like four strings left on it. Shouting, sweating. Grabbed hold of a preacher's hand. Started shaking and quaking on the power of God. Went out. <laughs> My back had been hurt. First, I thought I broke my back. I was laying there and couldn't move and didn't hurt. So I just started worshiping God in my head. I thought, well, if I'm a quadriplegic now, there's a whole lot of problems I don't have to deal with. A lot easier to keep your flesh under control if your flesh is out of your control. <laughs> Began to worship the Lord in my mind. Feeling came back, set up, realized the back pain was gone, lifted my hands to say hallelujah, and something else fell out of my mouth. A little bit astonished, but a whole lot happy. It's been something I've been pressing for. I think I'm still in Brother Gill the other day. I think. A lot of people hear, hear that thing in their head before they ever speak it. We all have the ability to quench the spirit. You hear that voice speaking in your head, you say, well, I don't understand those words. And you've got to wrestle with your own personal pride about whether I'm going to say this thing that I don't have any clue what it means. And everybody around me is going to think it sounds like mumbo jumbo. Just junk. But I keep hearing it ringing my ears and my head. And you, what you do is you yield to that. Because this feels like something you didn't get exposed to in a bar room. You didn't get exposed to at a strip club. You didn't get exposed to at a ball game or a wrestling match. You got exposed to this in the presence of the Almighty. And if you yield to that, and I can't explain it, I don't understand exactly how or why, but when you yield to that thing and it's the presence of God 
and it begins to flow out of you, it changes perspective. It changes strength. It changes anointing and ability. Amen. And, and that's, I had a good friend down in Florida. He was raised Baptist almost all his life, wasn't he? Brother Register. Yeah. And finally when he, he got past all the unbelief and, and finally just yielded and, and, and began to be filled with the Holy Ghost in a manner which he'd never experienced. And I'm not doubting his salvation. I'm just telling this is something a little different than he had ever experienced. He stood up and testified. He said, it's like trading in a slingshot for a shotgun. <laughs> Amen. Things have changed. And he's still going on. He buried his wife last year after a hard-fought battle with cancer. But guess what? He's still pressing on for Jesus. Amen, amen. You say, well, well, there's a lot of people, we've, a lot of us has faced, back here, my Uncle Raymond just faced some of the hardest things a man ever has to face in his life, but he's still pressing on. Amen. But I, I'm telling you, I, I'm dealing with this natural vessel, this vessel of clay, I need all the help I can get. I need all the refreshing I can get. I need all the rest I can get. Amen. And there in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He's not talking about the day of Pentecost. This is some time after. I thank God there's still times of refreshing. There's times in His presence. Amen. The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and He shall send Jesus Christ which was before which before was preached unto you. Amen. Refreshing. That word in the Greek amen, in the Greek word 4,103 or 403, it literally means recovery of breath. Now, now you know, when he, when he breathed upon him, he said, receive you the Holy Ghost. <sighs> that word is pneuma. Mean literally breath. Receive. Well, well, why, why would he say that? Because when, when he spoke Adam into existence, he breathed in his nostrils. <sighs> breath. Amen. Here. And, and there was a. But here he said. The times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And this refreshing is recovery of breath. Or revival. When you feel like you've gone the last mile away, you have spiritually died. I don't know anybody that hasn't reached that point at some point as they've lived for God any period of time at all. You felt yourself wither. You felt your faith, faith begin to fail. There was no spark left. There was no joy left. It was just mechanical going through the, going through the motions. But he said this, he said, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, that recovery of breath, I'm going to breathe on you again. Amen. I'm going to revive you and make you what you're supposed to be. Amen. Refreshment, sustenance, and nourishment. But thank God for that refreshing of the Holy Ghost, the presence of his power. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, and I'm fixing to close, said that God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why? This next verse is the key. I don't understand. Why does he choose to do it that way? I don't understand either. That's part of the point. That no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why it's wrong for him to teach how to do it. Somebody else can glory. Somebody else, I, 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 they, they, so this man got, got the Holy Ghost under my ministry. Yep, they counted in, in, the, in the New Testament how many souls were added. Didn't say specifically who preached, if anybody. Let us know that what revival can be like. 
But it's not that they could get glory. It's for glory unto God. That thing took a dark turn. Scare me to death to go saying, well, I have this many get saved under my ministry and have this many get filled with the Holy Ghost under my ministry. Now, I have had folks get saved under my ministry. I was reading, reading today how the apostles, they'd had a revival and they sent for the apostles to come pray for them they'd receive the Holy Ghost. But they'd already had a revival. Something was going on. Why, why isn't there? I, I don't read about how they came and taught them how to speak. They laid hands on them. They imparted it to them. Made a believer even out of the sorcery. Yeah, he, his heart wasn't right, but, but he was there and seen and believed it. And according to how some read it, some say he received it. Heard a man preach a wonderful message on that. But I want to be in his presence, don't you? In his presence. We get hung up in doctrine and nobody benefits. Oh, we've got to have doctrine to make it. Understand that. But, but if I preach to you doctrine and doctrine, 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 The letter killeth. And I, I preach on sin. You better not do this. You better not do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I know there's chapters deal with it. And I deal with it. But you know where I really like to spend my time? In His presence. And you don't get there. I can't drag you there. You might accidentally wind up there when you get in the presence of believers who have ushered in His presence by worship. But you can get there by yourself in a car or in a closet in your room. I don't know how many times I'm sitting there in my living room in my chair with a guitar in my lap or a Bible in my lap just start worshiping Reaching out to God and the tears flow. I feel His presence. Sometimes just shut everything off. I can even have gospel music coming through the television set. Just shut everything off. You can ask my wife. Just shut everything off. And just sit there and cry out to God. Worship Him. He's worthy. He knows what tomorrow holds. He knows who I was yesterday. He knows who I am at my worst. He knows what I desire to be at my best. He loves me in spite of all that. In His presence. In His presence. Hallelujah. That no flesh should glory in His presence, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What? We, we got to get wise and righteous and sanctified and redeemed? No, you missed it. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You stay in His presence. He brings that stuff with Him. Hallelujah. That according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Are we fleeing His presence? Or are we inviting His presence? Are we rushing to his presence? It's one thing that stirs me up about camp meetings. Generally, the people don't want to be there, aren't there? Generally, at camp meetings, just folks that want to be in church. They want to be in his presence. I, I don't know that I've ever had a hard time preaching.
preached and the camp meeting wants to start preaching. Now I've had a few butterflies before I get up. Especially you look out and there's 600 folks and five of your favorite preachers been preaching 25 years longer than you. You pick up the microphone and and then you begin to review in your head or in your heart what it is that you felt like God laid on your heart to preach. And you say, God, am I really supposed to preach about zombies tonight? And you start preaching, Brother Gill, and you get about a half a dozen people sitting up close to the front, just get up and walk out of the church. And God, is this, is this right? Friday night at camp meeting, it's not supposed to feel like that. They got outside and had a powwow and decided, well, they hadn't heard what I was saying yet. Maybe they ought to come and find out what I was preaching about. Ringleader, one of the first in the altar. The altar's filled up three or four deep. He stayed in the altar for over a half hour. Huh? got saved that night. <laughs> Amen. He said, I got back in here and got to listen to what you were saying. You're right, preacher. We was walking dead. We was carrying around a lot of dead stuff we shouldn't have been having. His presence. The people came to be in His presence. Not my presence, His presence. It's what I love. It's what I long for. Things happen in His presence. Sicknesses go away in His presence. Really good. Minds get mended in His presence. Families get prepared in His presence. My son got a very special and genuine miracle. He's about 16. Nobody laid hands on him. He was standing behind me singing. A little church in, in Dawsonville, Georgia. It wasn't me that did it. It wasn't mama did it. It wasn't the pastor that did it. It was his presence. His presence just swept in and changed that young man's mind. Changed his behavior. Changed his way of thinking. Amen, amen. I want to be in his presence. I want more of him. Hallelujah. Thank you. 